Hey guys, it's Nick. Welcome to another episode of Team Mars 365. In today's lesson, I'm going to show you how to set up an anti phishing policy within Microsoft Defender for Office 365. I'm here within the Defender Admin Center and I've gone under email and collaboration to the policies and rules section and then threat policies here to get to my main policy page. Anti phishing policies are great because they help prevent phishing attacks and they can also provide safety tips to users so they can avoid these that actually come through the first layer of protection. If I click into here, you'll notice that there is a default policy that is created and available within any new tenant. This provides you a base level of settings here. You can actually edit this default policy, but you could never delete this from your tenant. They always want you to have at least one policy for protection purposes. You can create additional policies here and they will take precedence and you could add multiple policies if you wanted to scope different users for more restrictive policy controls within these policies as well too. The big thing to note here that I want to touch on is that the anti-phishing policies are available with the standard Exchange Online Protection settings that you get. With Defender for Office 365, additionally you get impersonation settings that you can configure as well as advanced phishing thresholds, which we'll get here in just a second. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new policy here and just give it a name. Next here, we can scope this to users, groups, and domains. So starting to type in one of these fields will give you the ability to select someone within your organization under users, groups with under groups, and under domains, you can select your domain there as well too. You could say that you wanna include everybody under this domain and then maybe exclude certain users or groups from that section as well too. So there's multiple ways that you can configure this. If this is your first time testing this out, I would recommend scoping this to a minor group, maybe a proof of concept that you would do just to make sure that the settings that you're including aren't disrupting user workflows. Next here, you're able to configure all these settings and then we'll get into the actions next. This email threshold that you see here goes from standard to most aggressive. And at the end of the day, it's essentially saying that Microsoft's classifying things as low confidence fish, medium confidence, or very high confidence. And the more aggressive you get with that, anything that's classified and in the sense of most aggressive will encompass all of the low, medium, and high degrees of confidence and bundle them up and say that it's, it's high degree of confidence. So there's rolling everything up. You can obviously bump these things up, but the big thing to note is that you probably will have more false positives the higher you get up in here as well too. So I'd recommend either starting with standard or aggressive and kind of testing out things for a while and seeing if you can bump that up or if bumping it up creates too many false positives and it's disrupting workflows. Next here, you're able to configure these impersonation settings for users and domains. Impersonation can be done at the user level. In the example that you see here, we may have Michelle, for example, and the one Michelle has two L's within her name. Domains could also be used, and numbers are a common example of adding a number within a common domain that you have and purchasing that domain to impersonate it. So within here, you can enable users to protect. And what I would recommend in this section, like they mentioned up top here, is adding people in key roles. If you think about an example of this, this is only gonna really happen in scenarios where you have a manager or higher level people in the company uh, being impersonated so that they can garner new information from lower employees. And so within here, you're probably only gonna to wanna to specify high level workers, managers, things like that, that you would want to add to this particular impersonation protection setting. You can also enable that protection on your domains that you own as well too, which is one of the recommendations I have. You could also include custom domains if you're working with another partner that may have a lot of correspondence with you. Again, ideally here with this policy, you're making it restrictive, but you're also sending out outliers here so that it's going to have a better percentages of actually capturing the attackers that you want versus causing a bunch of disruption within the organization. You could add trusted senders and domains that will not get flagged for impersonation here. And additionally, you can enable Mailbox Intelligence, which I would recommend, which basically uses AI to recognize the sender and who they interact with most within the organization or externally, so they can better provide safety tips when they recognize an email that they haven't interacted with lately or you know ever at all. Enable Intelligence for Impersonation Protection is also recommended. This gives you the ability on the next action page here to define what to do whenever a email is coming in and classified as impersonation. So it could be things like quarantine or junk mail and things like that. 
Enable spoof intelligence is also recommended as well too. Spoofing is when the from address in an email doesn't match the domain of the email source. When a sender spoofs an email address, they appear to be a user within your organization's domains or user within an external domain that sends email to your organization. There's legitimate purposes for spoofing like a marketing company, for instance, sending on your behalf. But in most cases, you're going to want to lock this down as well too. So I would recommend enabling the spoof intelligence here. These actions here classify what to do across all those things that we just set, like impersonated user domain and mailbox intelligence for impersonated user and spoofing as well too. So with all these, you have a variety of actions that you can take. In a lot of these cases, you're going to work with these two, which is moving it to the junk folder or quarantining the message. And I won't go through each one of these because it's pretty redundant, but you get the idea of the settings you would want to configure. The safety tips and indicators are listed here as well too. These are really cool because they add these tool tips within the Exchange environment and the Outlook environment for a user that shows them tips like being able to show the first contact for instance. So this is saying, hey, you never talked to this person before and this is great to identify a spoofing or impersonation attempt that may be coming into them. These next two user and domain impersonation safety tips. I might recommend that you leave these off just simply because it takes any of the users or domains you've added in your previous threshold limit and it shows them a vague message about potentially this may be somebody impersonating your domain. So it's good in the fact that it could cause them to do some further investigation, but I think that would kind of get a little bit of annoying uh, to that user as well too just because they see that every time and they're having to check every time. The show user impersonation unusual character safety tip is a good one as well here too. You see this example where they have MarriottCantoso.com, which has a mix of uppercase letters and a zero within there as well too, which is a common tactic when you think about phishing or, or spoofing impersonation, things like that. Show question mark for unauthenticated senders for spoof. This is a setting used for whenever you don't have the SPF DMARC DKIM records coming through that proves the authentication for that user. It is one I would recommend turning on. And then show the via tag is great for spoofing. As you can see here as this example, we can see the true sender address there, the fabricrom.com. It's another great one to put in for the users to see as well. When you're done here, you can click on next and you have a summary of all the settings that you just set up here. And then you can click on submit to go ahead and create this policy. This has been created now and we can see it. it's on and it's taking a higher priority here over this lowest one here. So it will take precedence if there's conflicting settings here within this policy or if it's conflicting against the scope. This is everything that I wanted to showcase for you guys in today's video on setting up an anti-phishing policy with Defender for Officer 65. Stay tuned for my next lesson where I'll be walking you through setting up a safe links policy as well here within the Microsoft Defender Admin Center. Thanks guys, have a great day.